Hey, this is Michael Van Osh with the Journal. Welcome again. We've got another great interview for you. And if you haven't already, hit the harkjournal.com and sign up for our daily email where you get a two minute tip for a better life and career based on Shakespeare's wisdom. So today we've got a great interview for you and I'm really looking forward to uh, digging into this with Charles. We have Charles Pasternak. Charles, you're the uh, founder and artistic director of Porters of Hell's Gate Theater Company in Los Angeles. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm very happy to be here. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I love the <laughs> journal. I'm really, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. Thank you so much. You know, first and foremost, tell us about Porters of Hell's Gate. How did you guys, when did you start it? Why did you start it? And then you got to explain the name to us too. Yeah, um, I started it in 2006. Um, I had just gotten back from spending some time in New York. Um, you know, young actor, uh, often, often doing theater for free, just trying to keep, you know, feeding the soul while, while, while trying to make a living and waiting tables. And, you know, I had a pair of friends who were actors and, you know, we didn't really decide to start a company. We decided to just put up a show, you know, we're like, well, if we're, if we're working for nothing, why don't we work for nothing with each other? And we put up a, a production of Julius Caesar. We rehearsed in a backyard. We you know, found a little black box to do it in. And, um, and it went well enough. I mean, we all pitched in money and we got, and one, I think a, 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 a girlfriend's mother donated a thousand dollars. Um, nice. yeah. So we had like three, I, I don't know, we might've had like 2,500 bucks and we, so we put up the Caesar modern dress. Um, it went really well. We got good reviews, uh, a nice turnout. We were able to pay everybody a little something, um, which was not guaranteed, but we did. We, we recouped our money and then, and then we just kept doing it. And maybe three or four shows in, we sort of attached, I think we had attached the name Porters of Hell's Gate early, just for like posters and stuff like that. But I don't think we were really thinking of ourselves as a company until three or four shows in. Um, okay. What year did you start? We started late 2006. Okay. So, um, uh, and the Caesar opened at the end of that year. I remember that it ran two weekends in 2006 and then the first two weekends of 2007. So that was the, so it's been, you know, 14 plus years now, which is amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, our mission statement is to do the canon. Um, we've done some other things around there, but we've done over 30 Shakespeare's. Um, we're going to finish them. Uh, historically, it, we may be the first company in the history of LA to do it. There's some debate about that. And, and I don't even need to parse it. I, I'll be proud if we just do it. But if we are the first, that's also pretty cool. Um, and yeah, you know, we've, we've done some original plays. We've done uh, a Greek tragedy. We've done, we did Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and Dead when we did Hamlet. So we, you know, we've, we've trickled in some other stuff especially some like Hollywood Fringe Festival offerings and things yeah. like that. But really our focus is Shakespeare. And now that we're getting really close to the end, now that we're at 30 or 31, um, you know, it's like we're, <laughs> the blinders are coming on. Like any suggestion of doing something else, you know, everybody, because we have an artistic board that's, who's all working for nothing uh, or, you know, and, and the idea of finishing is very exciting to all of us. And, uh, and so, yeah, any idea, any, any imp implication of something else sort of gets battered aside now. So <laughs> once, um, once we can do theater again, um, yeah. we'll get back to it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Well, tell us about the quote that you chose to uh, name your theater. Yeah, company. so the quote, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the quote is, if a man were a, porters of, a porter of Hell's Gate, he should of old turning the key from the Scottish play. Um, and you know, I've answered this question many times over the years. It's one of those things, I, I love our name and I'm proud of it. You know, it, it might've been easier to just go with like no ho shakes or something like that. But um, uh, it's a great quote from the Scottish play. I, a friend of mine and I, years before it sort of settled on it as like the name of a company if we ever started one and that friend and I never did. Um, there was something about the drunken porter at the gates of hell. There was something about, there's a certain irreverence to it. You're doing, you're naming your company after a quote from the Scottish play, which is in, you know, theater in, in the world of theater, a sort of taboo. Um, and the idea of, 
you know, demons at the door, the idea of uh, drinking. I, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that many of many of the com that the many of the companies sort of related to and enjoyed. Yeah. Um, you know, we generally go by the porters um, that quotes on everything. It's nice to say, remember the porters uh, instead of remember the porter, which is the quote from the play. Yeah. So there's lots of little taglines and stuff, but the true answer is there's no, there's no like very specific, like golden reason why we named ourselves this. We sort of thought it was cool. It was hanging around in our heads. There's lots of little things we've been able to use it for. Um, but no, there's no great sort of <laughs> major reason. We, we liked it. Um, well, it is cool, and it and it gets your attention because I, you know, being in LA and I'm in Atlanta, I had not heard of you before, and when mm -hmm. I saw you online, I was like, "Wow, what is this? Let's look into this." So, cool. yeah, excellent, excellent. Good. Well, what I'd like to do is read a little bit for the folks that are listening about uh, your background and the things you're you've done, and then maybe get into some questions about that. So, right. we're going to read a little bit here, folks, but but because uh, Charles has done a lot, so. You're founder, artistic director, and resident artist of The Porters. And uh, as a director there, you've directed Cymbeline, which had a Broadway World nomination, Pericles, Henry V, Time of Athens, The Merry Wives, uh, you had a Senior Award for that, Troilus and Cressida, Comedy of Errors. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona, Richard III, and of course, Caesar that you mentioned before. Yeah. And there's more to that than two. Uh, but you also co-developed and directed a, a play called Limousine Midnight Blue with a gentleman named Jamie Hecht. We want to hear about that based on his book of poetry. Uh, and then you've also, uh, of course, you're an actor and uh, you've done a lot there uh, with, with uh, Porter's Iago, Henry V, Hamlet, Mark Antony, and... Um, Folks, he's also worked uh, everywhere else too. Let's, let's like like your T-shirt, the American Players Theater, Coachella Valley Rep, uh, Alabama Shakes, Indiana Rep. Uh, what else? Shakespeare Festival, St. Louis. You know, Sierra Rep and Santa Cruz, uh, or sorry, Shakespeare, Santa Cruz, and and more. So, wow. Uh, how long have you been at this as an actor and director? Well, as uh, you know, I was lucky. I started when I was about uh, eleven or twelve. My I grew up in Topanga Canyon in Los Angeles, and there's a there's a, an equity outdoor summer repertory theater there called the Wilbur Theatrical Botanicum. And yeah. I, and around 10 or 11, my parents, you know, there was like a little Shakespeare class at school. I liked it. My parents put me in the sort of summer camp there, and I was just sort of hooked, man. I, I, I started doing all the classes. It was my first first paycheck I ever made was mucking out bathrooms and cleaning the grounds and working the box office and house managing. And um, I graduated from the young classes to the teenage classes. And then I started sort of not coaching the young classes, but I was, you know, I was, well, whatever it was at the time, like an intern, I, I was an extra body sort of taking care of things. And, um, and I essentially grew up there. I mean, I would, it's a summer rep, but they had fall and winter classes, which I always mm -hmm. took. And, um, you know, so from a young age, it was either going to be that or baseball. And, um, and I just wasn't, I just did not get big enough and strong enough to, to, you know, base, I made, you know, it's like I made the high school team, but eventually it's, I, it was clear I wasn't going to be playing much and drama, drama was, was the better choice. And so, you know, so I started right. there, I started taking professional acting classes with a brilliant man named Larry Moss, very famous, um, mm -hmm. when I was 16. Uh, so I got very lucky to be introduced to to the world of acting and theater and professional training early. And then I, um, you know, and then I just sort of started giving it a go. I, um, I, I remember graduating high school and sort of, uh, or finishing high school, I should say. I, I was actually a credit short of graduating. Um, and... You know, it's funny, nobody, nobody prepares you for this stuff. It was like, where do I find auditions? Where do I, agents and reels and pictures. And I mean, even grad schools don't prep some people for this. And I find that awful because people are paying them a bunch of money for it. But um, I don't, uh, I had no idea what to do. So I just sort of started, I finally found a backstage. I started auditioning. I started doing some plays for free. Um, but I had grown up loving Shakespeare and focusing at that on that in the at the at the theater I was at, and um, eventually I started finding some Shakespeare to do for free with various yeah. people, and eventually I started this company. And then the real the real key thing 
in starting the Porters was that the Caesar I directed and I played Mark Antony and I got some very good reviews and I, I faxed them to my LA agents who had sort of, I'd signed with a New York agency that had an LA branch. The LA agents didn't really know who I was or what to do with me. So it was doing that show, getting good reviews and faxing them to them. One of them came out and saw it. And the next week they started getting me auditions. It's like, it was my introduction to them. And then the fourth show we did was a production of Titus Andronicus in which I played a, a far too young Titus, uh, though I did spray paint my hair gray. So, um, <laughs> but um, a beautiful, generous actor named Paul O'Connor, Oak, who was a 20 year veteran of Oregon Shakespeare Festival. His, uh, his dear friend, Marco Baricelli had just taken over Shakespeare Santa Cruz and was looking for a non-union Romeo. And Paul O'Connor saw me in this little black box production. And he called Marco and said, I saw this kid, he's good, you should see him when you're in LA. And Marco did, and I, I got the part. I, you know, I played Romeo that summer, that was 2008. And I can trace three quarters of my theater career to the four seasons I spent at Shakespeare yeah. Santa Cruz. The directors I worked with there, the connections I made. Um, so, I mean, I worked my tail off and I started the company. I made these things happen. But at the same time, I also got lucky. I got lucky that certain people saw me at the right time. I got lucky to start my training early. Um, and I got lucky not only to be impassioned about this kind of work, language work, but to find people who were mentors. Um, yeah. You know, I had a long, I had many, many mentors and many people who valued the work in the way I do now and nurtured me in the, in the ways I, uh, in the ways I came up. And, you know, we, I think we live in a theater world with a, with a sort of, people have different opinions now about language plays and, um, and uh, doing uh, verse work and doing, doing the kind of work that, there's just, there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of cultural debate going on right now about what certain things mean and how to do certain things. And I, I'm, I'm pretty impassioned about the work and what I think is the craft of the work. And I, I'm, I, I think I was lucky to, to come up with the people I, I came up with. Um, nice. So yeah, well, long, ask long, you, when you were yeah. a young kid, you mentioned, you know, you, you were exposed to Shakespeare and you got it right away or it really, you know, it did something for you. Why do you think that is? Because that's, you know, that's not necessarily the case with most people at a young age. Yeah, um, I think there's a few things. You know, I think psychologically there was certainly a desire to be seen um, and to show off. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, I have a good ear for it. Uh, I think there is something about the language and the rhythm of the language that really appealed to me. Um, yeah. And I couldn't have told you that for years. You know, I didn't really know that as a kid, but looking back, you know, it really, the po I don't want to say, it's not, not the flowery element of the poetry, though I love that, but the rhythmic element of the poetry really struck a chord with me, really caught something with me. And I, um, I, it was, I, that was sort of the bug that I think infected me. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there was probably, there was definitely something about wanting a, a, a voice or to be seen. Um, and then there was something internally about the rhythm of the work. And I mean, I, I think I got the rhythm of, of his language or that's what spoke to me earlier than anything else. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So those were, the, I think those were the early hooks. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that at this point in your career, there's, there's one performance or one time that you say, you can point to and say, that's probably my proudest moment? Um, no, no, but I could give you a few different, you know, my proudest moments have probably been a few sort of surreal, almost high moments of being at a bar after a show uh, that the Porters did and seeing this group of, do, uh, do, you know, dozens of people, many of whom have gotten married, some of whom have had kids, uh, all of whom have shared joy and passion and sadness on stage and off stage. My, I think my proudest moments have been looking at those groups and, 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 and having the small prideful moment of being like, I did this. Yeah. Like I brought these people together. I, uh, they wouldn't be married. They wouldn't know each other. They wouldn't, you know. And so I have, those, those are the moments I'm sort of proudest of. And that's related to theater, but not, not in the theater. 
Um, yeah. uh, the most fun I've ever had was playing Hotspur um, <laughs> in Henry IV at uh, the Shakespeare Festival of St. Louis. Yeah. Um, but the proudest, you know, I just, I just did a Hamlet at the Clarence Brown Theater in Knoxville, Tennessee. Getting to do that was a big deal for me. You know, I did it with the, with the Porters 10 years ago. So doing it in my mid twenties and then getting to come back to it in my mid thirties. Um, that was great. I hope I get another shot at it, but I loved doing it. It was with a, a director, John Sipes, who I've worked with four times, four or five times now. It was sort of, it was the culmination of a, a lot of our work. And, yeah. um, you know, we almost got to close. We lost the last weekend to the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which at the time was a gut punch at the time I was furious, but now I'm like, I'm just thankful. I got to run it all, you know, uh, sure. n none of us sort of knew what the full extent was going to be. Um, you know, I, I did work at American players theater last year. That was one of my proudest moments in that, you know, in some ways I think I was born too late. You know, I want my, I love repertory companies. I want to, I would love to be a member of a repertory company. I've sort of built myself a repertory company in Los Angeles, you know, but um, they don't exist anymore. Um, yeah. And uh, and theaters claim they can't afford them, but I I, I call bullshit on that. I I I've seen I, I I've seen the numbers. Uh, I think companies can be cheaper. The problem is you have to you have to build a season around a company of actors, and I don't think many um, many people running theaters right now care to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, so now I'm not saying every theater must have a company, but it was an intrinsic part of the founding of the regional theater movement in this country. And now there are very few left that do it. The yeah. American Players Theater has a core company. They have some of the most excellent actors in the country. Uh, their, their value for the work and for the art is immense. Uh, their repertory system is wonderful. Their theater is gorgeous. You're treated beautifully. You know, I'm proud of that in that I have long admired them and to get get to be a part of it. Um, you know, I was proud of my work. I, I played Napoleon in uh, George Bernard Shaw's Man of Destiny and blew my mind open for Shaw, a brilliant voice and text coach, Susan Sweeney, who's sort of a, a legend in the in the voice and text world. I got to work, you know, I worked with her every day. It was really incredible. Um, and um, so I was really proud of the work. Um, I, I sort of last minute understudied Torvald in Doll's House and went on for a show. I mean, there was some chaos, uh, wonderful people. Um, so I was really proud of, proud of much of the work, but truly I was just proud to be a part of the company. I mean, that was the, yeah. and in feeling that and going, actors don't get this in America anymore. Um, you know, I, I'd spent, Four Seasons with Shakespeare Santa Cruz. It was wonderful. I loved it. But I, you know, and I felt like a part of a company. There was a group of us, but there was no official company. Um, yeah. And uh, I spent three seasons in St. Louis. Loved it. Wonderful people. Uh, I'd love to, you know, I, but there's no company. Um, there's many people that come back year after year, and that's wonderful. Um, but there's no commitment. Uh, they're not making any commitment to you. Um, yeah. And so, not that, you know, so I, I, I just, I'm rambling, I guess, but, um, but, but spending, spending last year at American Players Theater, I was very proud of as well. Um, nice. Yeah. Sounds very good. I like it. What, so speaking of the pandemic, since it's hit, what have you and the rest of your company been doing? Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. We, um, nobody really knew, we had a fun, you know, we, we had our big yearly fundraiser planned. We were building the online all the online stuff. We, all, we do like a big party at a wine bar kind of thing. Um, and we literally, the artistic board was considering the draft of the invitation. Oh. And then as everything started happening and we're like, well, maybe let's wait a week and see what's, see what's really happening. You know, and then we decided to wait a month. And then so clearly it wasn't, wasn't gonna happen. Um, so we held off on the fundraiser. Um, you know, we work at the same theater a lot, but we're an itinerant company. We don't have rent to pay, thank God. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we 
I mean, look, the storage space bills build up and stuff like that, but um, but we, you know, the, the, we're not we're, we're safe from like rent killing us right now. Right. Um, so you know, we were we did a few Zoom read um, workshops on the Henry Fours, which in in the cards I was going to come back here and probably workshop and start directing. You know, we were probably that was probably going to be our big project for the year was doing both parts in rep. Yeah. Um, and so we, we did a few workshop zoom reads and, you know, eventually you start burning out. It's like, why are, if, when, when everything's so far ahead, uh, you know, uh, one of the, uh, artistic board, Will Block, who has a wonderful company of his own called Method and Madness Theater. They're, they've been doing weekly readings, weekly zoom readings. Um, I think they're down to bi-weekly now, but still, I mean, I'm, very proud of him and I love the sort of motivation, but I don't have it. Um, to be honest, I don't like Zoom theater very much. I think it's, yeah. I think it's better than nothing. I'm glad we're doing it, I'm, you know, but, um, but I don't really like it. I, I, I don't think it's a good, I actually, I prefer a, a radio play. I think radio theater is better than Zoom theater. Um, yeah. The only thing it lacks is the sort of live event quality of Zoom theater, which Again, we're trying to replace theater, which is impossible to do, but you know, each, each brings its own. So the Zoom thing has a live aspect. The radio theater, I think it's just better in terms of sort of working upon your ear, uh, working, you know, plays of, plays of language. Um, uh, so the Porters are talking about doing a radio play. Um, we're talking about doing two or three maybe Zoom reads before the end of the year as sort of events. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, we, yeah, that's, that's what we're looking at. I mean, we're just sort of, we're huddling down and, yeah. and, um, and just gonna, we're just gonna try to survive the storm um, and put up a few things, keep reminding people we exist uh, and wishing our, you know, we have a nice loyal group of, a nice small loyal group of subscribers and friends and people that support the theater and, they want to know what we're doing. They want things to happen. So we, we, want, to, we want to meet that need, um, but it is, it's hard to motivate um, to do m much more than that right now. Um, yeah. In the interim, personally, I have started a, uh, a pay what you can Zoom Shakespeare class um, mm -hmm. on Mondays, which is going great. Uh, it's been three weeks now. I didn't know what to expect. I was sort of nervous. I've never, I've done some private coaching, but I've never taught like a class. Um, and um, very text-based, very technical, very craft-based. Um, no, uh, no sort of big ideas, just like here are te technical things that will help you with this work. And I think it's gone really well. And you know, the pay what you can aspect is good for now because people are hard up and um, and it's hard and I ask people to give what they can, um, you know, and I have some, I have some people that can give a bit more and, and that sort of balances out the fact that a lot of people are giving yeah. five or 10 bucks. Some people are given nothing, which is totally fine. Um, but it's been really good for me personally, both because it's given me a creative outlet to focus on the work I love um, and to collaborate with artists. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not the same as performing. It's not the same as putting up a play, but it's better than a Zoom read to me to like get into the mud and get some work done and, and really look at something uh, for the benefit of people. And yet at the same time, without any, without having to perform it, um, it's been great. Um, Are you doing that in person, socially distanced or over Zoom? Over Zoom, over okay. Zoom. So, and just this last week I opened up we, I started it a bit, or we started it earlier. So there's sort of an East coast section. So anybody in a later time zone. Yeah. Um, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to provide you. Yeah, where, uh, where can you, people find that? What's uh, yeah. Go to my website, my website, go to charlespasternak.com. And yeah. then the teaching section has all okay. the info you need. So just my name, charlespasternak.com. And then there's a, a teaching section that, uh, that has the flyer, a link where you can, uh, contact me to join the class list and uh, and just all the basic info. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I saw that. You have a nice website, by the way. So thank we'll, you. We'll put all that information in the show notes here. That'd be great. I appreciate that because yeah, um, yeah we've we, it's been a nice turnout so far. But it's Zoom. You know, I can I can take more. It'd be it'd be it'd be great. Yeah, for sure. 
So let's yeah. change gears a little bit here. Tell us a little bit more about the non-Shakespeare stuff you've done. And specifically, I want to hear about um, Midnight Blue. Uh, it was called, actually called Limousine, Midnight Blue. Tell yeah, us yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's wonderful. So um, Jamie Hecht, Dr. Jamie Hecht, who has, I, he used to have a website. I'll bet he still does. Um, look him up. He, I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um, when we did Julius Caesar in uh, 2006, seven, first show, Jamie sort of caught me in the parking lot and he, you know, he's this wonderful sort of East Coast Jew uh, and uh, he had seen the show and loved it and was, you know, he sort of caught me and I was sort of caught off guard. He's like, hey, love the show. I thought you were brilliant. Um, I published a translation of Sophocles' uh, trilogy. You should do it. And he hands me the book. And, you know, and there's, there's a lot of energy coming at me, but he's such a sweet man. I said, uh, thank you. Um, and I think he saw Caesar again, and maybe we had a drink or something. And he had written a beautiful translation of Shakespeare's, uh, I'm sorry, of, of uh, Sophocles' Oedipus Cycle. Um, really gorgeous. Uh, the Antigone had been done in New York, but, you know, part of what he was pitching was both the, both the uh, Oedipus and Oedipus at Colonus would be world premieres if we chose to do them. Um, so we didn't get to those for a number of years. Again, because at the beginning, we weren't really a company. We were just putting up shows, and it was sort of Shakespeare-focused. But in, I think, 2011, we did produce the world premiere of Oedipus the Tyrant, um, or Oedipus the King, though, J though Jamie went with Oedipus the Tyrant in his translation. Um, uh, I think it went very well. Jamie had acted with us in a few shows at that point. He wasn't, you know, it's interesting. He's a, he's a, he's a brilliant writer and poet. He, he had never really done much acting, but he, like I was saying about my early experience with Shakespeare, he has an ear for it. Yeah. So we needed, you know, we needed to work with him on some technique at points, but he had a great ear for it. He has a, a beautiful voice, you know, he, so, um, so he really worked and he, and, and we, he did a number of shows with us. So we did the Oedipus and um, I, th I think it was somewhere around then, I actually don't remember when exactly, but somewhere around then we started developing Limousine Midnight Blue. He had published a book of poetry called Lim Limousine Midnight Blue. It's 50 frames from the Zapruder film and it's about, and he takes 50 frames from the famous Zapruder film of the Kennedy assassination uh, in which he was writing in a midnight blue limousine and essentially writes these stunning poems about um, American history and violence and the brutality of what occurred and sort of how it, it, it really was a tipping point in the world. The world changed that day. Um, yeah. And um, gorgeous book of poetry. And when we started looking at it, he wanted to do some sort of performance art piece with it. I don't remember if the original conception was a show, but we were looking at it you know, and as we were reading through it, I said, you know, Jamie, I, a lot of these are very dramatic yeah. sonnets. They were, you know, they were all sonnets. No, I'm trying to remember. I think they're all sonnets, but I could be wrong. Some might be in slightly different structures. Um, but some of these are very performable. I mean, some of these are really dramatic, you know, and, and I think we took 30 of them, maybe 30 plus, and formed a show in which Jamie both played Kennedy and played himself, the poet, speaking about Kennedy. And we, we rearranged a few of them, but most of them stayed in order. It was just sort of the way he wrote it. And he, and he developed a, um, an, a, a musical soundtrack and a projection, an image sort of piece to go with it. And I directed him in the role. And I, long story short, I was, I, I, I was and remain supremely proud of it. It was an, it was an excellent show. And um, we did it independently and then the porters produced a uh, another a revival of it at the hollywood fringe festival nice. maybe a year or two after that um yeah it's really incredible if, if anybody's interested in the book of poetry i'm sure you can find it out there it's, it was published by red hen press okay uh, called limousine midnight blue um beautiful poetry and uh, and yeah i was very proud of the show and i would love to do it again and maybe 
you know, I mean, I guess there's no real age on it. I just sort of see Jamie, but you know, it's a show I would love to do. You know, it'd be a great one man show. And for me, I mean, actually I could start thinking about it now, but yeah. So anyway, long way around. I'm very proud of that. Um, very proud of that. Sounds like a very interesting project. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was. I'll um, definitely look up the, uh, look up the book for sure. Yeah. Is there any, is there anything else out there about the, uh, about the production that you did? or any stills of it or anything like that? Um, I'm sure there are some stills of it. I know Jamie took a video, um, but I don't, I don't know that that video has ever been released. That, I mean, he wasn't in any of the unions at the time, so he has every right to release it if he chooses. I don't know if he ever did. Yeah. Um, that also might have to do with how good the quality of video we got was. I, you know, you don't want to put it out if it looks shitty. Um, so I don't know. Um, but maybe I should reach out to him and ask him. Um, you know, if you if you, if you yeah, if you Google the show, I'll bet something pops up. Okay. But but I don't. I you know to be honest, I don't know. It's been a while since I since I sort yeah. of thought about that yeah. one. Well, let me ask you this. So so what's next for you and for Porter's? Where where do you see it all going for 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 both of you? Well, um, it's hard to know, man. You know, uh, uh, the the company's not going anywhere. We're, we're sticking around. Our plan was to do the Henry Forsen rep. Whether or not that's the first thing we can do out of pandemic or not, I don't know. We'll see. We are looking at doing a radio play during the pandemic. And again, maybe a few Zoom things. Those, are, those would be sort of like one night events. The radio play might be something that we really start, you know, try to put together like a show. Um, and you know, we essentially for the next few years, we got eight Shakespeare's left. Yep. That's going to be the target. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, for the Porters, we're not going anywhere. What's going to be left of the smaller or mid mid-sized theater community in Los Angeles after this all ends, who knows how many theaters will still be open around available. Um, but no matter what, we're, we're going to, we're, we're around, we're going to finish the canon. Um, for me, I'm, I'm, this class has really been wonderful for me. Um, I'm loving it. Uh, you know, I lost two jobs when the pandemic hit. I hope they'll come back around. Yeah. Um, I, one certainly is one I know will not come back around in 2021. It might come back in 2022. The other, I have no idea, but I'm, I hope work will come back. I mean, I was lucky enough to be working consistently with dips of unemployment, but um, all of these things, as, as anybody in the business sort of knows, they, I mean, all these things have momentum involved. So yeah. even when theaters can reopen, even when they decide they're brave enough not only to reopen, but like, will anybody come? You know, once they start risking those things, rolling the dice, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. A lot of the big reps will probably put back up the seasons they already had in place. So those, the people that were in those might have jobs, but the, but you know, for the rest of us, there's not, there's not, there's not even something to audition for, you know? Um, but you bring up a good point too about will people come back? You know, I've seen a lot of research lately, country yeah. countrywide about that, and and so far, the stats aren't great. In fact, they're terrible about when people want to come back. But you know, if a vaccine comes out and things change in that respect, I think it'll it'll tighten up, it'll quicken up a little bit. But you know, we can just hope. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think theater's truly going to return till there's a vaccine. Um, I. Uh, I remember thinking early in all this, I was like, well, maybe, maybe, you know, August, October, we'd have jobs again. Clearly not the case. Then I started thinking, well, maybe I'll bet every theater's going to try to get their Christmas carol and their Christmas show in because that's the big money maker. It's really important. Um, that's clearly not going to be the case. Um, because theater, theater doesn't just happen on a, you can't just turn on a dime. These things take preparation, they take planning, they take months. So even if they're, even if like a vaccine miraculously came out come October or November, which I don't believe will be the case. And even if it is, I think it may be more politically motivated than medically motivated. Um, but, you know, 
even if a vaccine miraculously comes out at one time, theaters haven't been planning ahead for that. You know, they can maybe start planning then. So three or four months ahead of that point. Um, so I know, I think theaters that have outdoor venues might, might do a better job of getting back to it sooner, um, especially larger outdoor venues where people can either sit far apart or if it's like an open field or something or an amphitheater with the grass where you could just say, I think those have a better chance of getting up and running sooner, but often those bigger things are more expensive, you know, so it's not easy for anybody. Um, and I hope, but no, I mean, I think real indoor seasons are gone until we have a vaccine. Um, yeah, I agree. Which it's is tough. It's a tough nut to swallow, but yeah, you're at, it's absolutely true. I think, yeah. I think that's right on. Yeah. So let me uh, let me finish up with the final question. I'd like to ask everybody here. So um, if you uh, if Shakespeare was on this call with us on this Zoom call with us, and you could ask him just one question, what do you think you'd ask him? Oh, wow. Um, what would I ask him? I don't know. I wouldn't ask him whether he was real. Um, <laughs> right. I I I wouldn't ask him about education. Or, what would I ask him? God, I don't know. I might ask him about the lost plays. Yeah. You know. Um, you know, I was talking to you about the Oedipus <laughs> translation that Jamie Heck did, and um, in his intro, he, he reminded us that we know that Sophocles wrote some 80 plus plays. We only have like seven or eight of them, you know, imagine the loss, you know, and we have 38 of Shakespeare's plays, you know, imagine if we only had, set, you know, even, you know, three or four of them, imagine the loss. So, you know, the lost plays do haunt me, the Cardenio Love's Labor's One, and all the things we haven't heard of, all the collaborations. Um, so, you know, that might not be the best answer. You know, there's also the part of me that wants to go, how did you write Hamlet? How did you write Rosalind? How did you write Falstaff? How did you write Cleopatra? You know, but those, as those questions come to me, I go like, how do you, how, do, how does he answer that? You know, <laughs> I just, I don't think, I don't think of him as a god. I think of him as a brilliant man. You know, he, he worked incredibly hard. Clearly, he was practical. How, how did he write that? You know, I, I don't know that he'd have a good answer for me. Um, yeah. You know, how did, how did Beethoven write his symphonies? You know, he, it, it wasn't magic. He was a genius. That time and circumstance came around. Um, so the sort of unspoken questions of my heart, I don't know that I could put properly into words and I don't know that he could properly answer. Yeah. So you, it's almost like this slightly deadened question of maybe about the lost plays, you yeah. know. Um, it would be interesting. Yeah, it would be, it would be interesting. It would be interesting, but that's, <laughs> so that's my sort of half-hearted answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big question there, easy to answer. So yeah. uh, Charles, uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us today. You know, everybody will put uh, uh, all the websites and everything. What's, what by the way, uh, your social media handles if you're on there? Um, I'm on Facebook. I, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm pretty low on the social media work okay. call, but um, yeah, I'm on Facebook. The link to that is on my website as well. You could also find, I think it's just Facebook slash dot com backslash Charles Pasternak. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, the website, charlespasternak.com really is sort of the central spot for all the info on me if anybody wants to look me up. All right. Well, good. And we'll put up the uh, Porter's website and everything else about yeah, that. Yeah, that'd be great as well. Thank you. The classes that you got going on. That's great news. And um, let's stay in touch. This has been really insightful and uh, love talking to, to guys over on the left coast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. This was a pleasure. And I love the journal. Please keep it up. We need we need every every little bit of art we can in the world right now. So So cheers to you and thank you for it. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be a part of it. Well, thanks so much. Pleasure meeting you and uh, we'll talk soon for sure. Thank you, Michael. Thanks.